You ask me where I'm from, and I will tell you the Midwest by way of the South. I will say I am as country as it gets. I will tell you the archives my family has kept by word of mouth. I will tell you the history we lived and the records I have sifted through. That storytelling, porch sitting, prayer saying tradition I was brought up in that brought me here today. My eyes behind my papa's a generation's worth of lives laid out on the living room floor. I will tell you about the medals and the soldiers, about the long line of men and women I come from who know firsthand that we are both the predecessor and the experienced consequence. I will tell you about the guns that we have known so long, about how my family shot back, how we country too. Listen to us talk, watch us pray, watch us hunt and fish, and the way we say where we from, I will tell you about the trees. I will tell you about the drive to Indianapolis from Russellville, Kentucky, the way we know the land, the gardens we've built in transit by only our black hands. You will just hear it in me, the way my voice refuses to bend, unlearn the phrases my mama once said, you will hear me say, mm 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 the devil is a lie. Glory be to all this I know, to the hymnals and the rhymes, to the double dutch and slide, the divine nine, the collard greens and the KYs. I am nothing if not the heritage I've inherited, the aftertaste of a spoken dream overmerited, the hunger pangs in the people who prepared it. I know what I'm owed in this country constructed on credit that I'm from. Let me tell you what pride is. Have you ever heard your grandma say and sing of her trust in him or the war cry? Oh, let me tell you what it tired is. The last hallelujah before the next, knowing we're the first byproduct of this endeavor and we are who made freedom, bare hand birthed it like all else, the roots, the digging, the harvest, the feast. I will tell you what stride is, how I know the world has moved in me. Watching the history they tried to hide become unburied testament to how far we've come. I will tell you the Midwest via the South. I'll say I'm as country as it gets. I'll tell you here, here, and then before. Believe me when I say I know where I'm from. Thank you. Uh, as you heard in the introduction, my name is Alyssa Gaines. I'm 19 years old. I'm currently a student about to go into my second year at Harvard College. Um, this past year, I was the sixth. <laughs> Thank you. This past year, um, I was fortunate enough to hold the title of National Youth Poet Laureate, which meant um, I was first the Youth Poet Laureate of my city, my hometown, Indianapolis. And then I competed with young poets from my region, which is the Midwest. And then I competed again with other poets from their regions. Um, and I ended up being able to be the Youth Poet Laureate of the United States. <laughs> For me, I got to serve as an advocate, speaking to the importance and the power of youth voice, and also I got to civically engage with various communities um, around topics that are important to me. And that's always been my journey with poetry. I started writing when I was really young. I wrote my first poem for an assignment in the third grade, and then my grandmas read it, and they thought it was amazing because they're my grandmas. And so <laughs> they started taking me to events around the city, workshops, youth poetry slams, um, and I kind of fell in love with the way that poetry gave people, even young people, a voice. And I got to learn about myself. I got to learn about my community. And I also got to speak up about things that were important to me. And I had people who were listening to the things I had to say. So poetry has meant everything to me. With that being said, I got to do a bit of a, a geographic introduction, um, a bit of my resume, but I have a poem here for you guys that I love to share whenever I'm introducing myself, um, especially in front of young people, because I know what it's like to sit in the audience and have someone come um, speak at you. And I, I want the young people to know that I, too, was once in middle school and also... I have not always been, you know, this polished speaker who's got their things like written out. Um, I was the student in the back of the class 
telling jokes with my friends. And so I have this poem for you guys called Hot Cheeto Girls. Um, and it, <laughs> it references that exact trend. Um, on TikTok, there was a trend called Hot Cheeto Girls. And it was very similar to all types of comedy skits that have circulated before, making fun of black women. You've got your like loud, angry um, caricature that non-black women would portray for laughs and jokes. And so here's my poem about it. In middle school, me and my homegirls were what would be called now Hot Cheeto Girls. Urban Dictionary defines Hot Cheeto Girls as a diet term for a racist stereotype I don't care to repeat. This term allowed non-black girls and boys to play dress up and feel powerful with baby hairs they didn't have, nails they couldn't pull off, and black scents that made them feel cool. Now... To everyone who's used this term but couldn't eat a bag of hot Cheetos without water and tears, look at you. On TikTok, making fun of the way me and my homegirls ate hot chips for breakfast because you were scared of our fire, scared we'd tell you your breath was hot. I hope you imagine me stank facing you through the screen. No, this black girl magic been trend since way before TikTok, since when we sat crisscross applesauce in the class, ball balls clacking in our braids, black girl laughing and trying to reclaim space that already belonged to us. Look at you. There is so much you don't know. Yes, we ate hot Cheetos, but also Takis, Arizonas, and Cosmic Brownies because we were our own world. What's a stereotype to a black girl who's already found acceptance in between the chip aisle and the beverages? Have you ever had to blast off on somebody? Have you ever had to be hot? Have you ever been the right one someone got? I remember me and my homegirls supporting each other past our anxiety, working up the courage whenever the time came that we were attacked because we didn't get to cry. Instead, we said, if you're feeling froggy, leap. (laughs) Have you ever woken up one day with this type of black girl poetry ingrained in your brain like a gift from the gods? Have you ever shaken the ground like, ah, (laughs) best friend, smacking your gum at teachers, flipping your braids at boys, and boom, you took off into a world of your own. Our attitude was earned. Theirs was learned. Boo. Why are they so obsessed with us and what we do? Yes, I was a hot Cheeto girl on the high honor roll that sang Hamilton at recess that now goes to Harvard. Yes, we have talents and layers too complicated for you to marginalize. And I bet you feel small trying to compensate with humor and attempt to bring all us bold, no-nonsense black girls back down from the cosmos we rule. You can't. Not even when you make fun of what makes me everything you fear. Not even when you make fun of our laughs, our joy. This is joy despite this is what you're looking for in between TikTok likes. And I hope you find some reason to fight in your life, some honor to defend, some kingdom of women with the genes in them to make a whole new world when this one has strayed so far far from them. But until then, keep me and my homegirls' names out your mouth. You'll never know double dutch. You'll never know slide clap. No matter how many times you snap your fingers in a Z formation, this magic is not for you. I hope you find some validity outside of the vicinity of your white supremacy. But until then, reference our magic only in the momentary pause you take between your sentences. Because that breath is the closest you'll ever get to our galaxy, period. Thank you. Um, I'm so excited to be here. If I haven't already said it, I want to emphasize it. Juneteenth for me is a holiday that's super important. I'm generational African American, descended from people enslaved here in the United States. And so to celebrate, you know, how far we've come, all the things we've done to define freedom and all of the the cornerstones of this country, um, it, it means a lot. And I think in my poetry, one thing I love to celebrate is my heritage, is the community of people that I represent and that I answer to. And so I'm always writing about black girls and the things we like to do and the things we go through. And so this next poem, I think, is is one of my favorites. It's a poem I wrote after um, the death of Breonna Taylor um, and processing and thinking through how, as specifically black women, do we encounter these tragedies and where can we turn? And to me, the answer was we can turn to each other and we can turn to the traditions and the culture that we know. 
So this poem is called Lagrimas Negras. Lagrimas Negras means black tears. It's the name of a Cuban bolero. And I think um, another important piece of this poem is the the global element of the culture that we carry and the way that the transatlantic slave trade left so many pieces of us all over, you know, not only the Western hemisphere, but just everywhere there is culture and there are women who understand. So here's this poem. Aunque tú me has dejado en el abandono, aunque ya has muerto todas mis ilusiones, En vez de maldecirte con justo encono, en mis sueños de colmo, en mis sueños de colmo, de bendiciones. An old Cuban bolero plays over the radio in my kitchen. I'm making empanadas de carne and agua de sandía barefoot. Pack the meat into dough con cuidado and fry until a golden crisp. Cut the watermelon into strips of pink and blend con azúcar. Last night, I heard the news of a black woman murdered in her sleep by killers who recently took a vacation to Florida, checked their bags and gold starred badge, and I was too hurt to cry. But this is not about hurt. Committed myself to rest and healing for her in my kitchen. My hands follow the path of black hands before me. My feet bare on a floor of dough flakes and watermelon water. I take a Cuban communion of empanadas and jugo in this kitchen in honor of every black girl who wrote her recipes on water. This bread be her body and this agua de sandia her sangre. I pray before I eat. I pray for forgiveness. I pray this time to a goddess past Florida. I know that she is the water. Sufro la inmensa pena de tu extravío. Siento el dolor profundo de tu partida. Y lloro sin que sepas que el llanto mío tiene lágrimas negras. Tiene lágrimas negras como en mi vida. A water of lagrimas negras, cursed or blessed, where black mothers fell gracefully in and baptized themselves way back when and now. I imagine this goddess got there with her arms out like Jesus. I imagine this goddess chose water over bondage. I know she is there, carrying secrets of self-healing, kitchen spells and traditions, telling us the whispers of when she turned water into agua fresca, bowing all our heads at the altar of frying grease. I know she's in all us black girls, trying to find a balance between fight and rest, learning to choose water over bondage. I know she floats our names when everyone else forgets to keep saying them, telling them take us serious like tide and teaching us how to take communion to ourselves, to transform in a kitchen, waking us up every morning. And when we mourn, I know she's in our tears, our lagrimas, and leads them to a shore somewhere, showing us that we are our own deities and we are the water. Oshun names an ocean for every Every black girl that dies and we cry quietly, they don't know that our sobs are lagrimas negras, negra, like the bottom of the sea where she lives, where when we die, we are washed again in our own water and we are finally safe. Contigo me voy mi negra, aunque me cueste morir. When it's my time to meet her, bury me in El Caribe, I can see her in every black sand beach her in Santiago, the black part of La Isla, or until then, I'll stand barefoot in my kitchen and cook the secret recipes that show our journey. Recipes maybe another negra made one day break bread and heal my body, listen to beautiful black boleros and take communion con agua de sandía that tastes like heaven far from here. Thank you. Um, and this next poem that I can share with you guys is another one that I really love. This is a circular poem, meaning the l- last line goes back into the first line of the poem. So it's meant to be said over and over and over. Um, I'll say it for you guys twice so you can hear how the things go together. Um, I love this poem a lot. I wrote it 
this this semester, Easter Sunday, it was my first Easter away from home and also my first Easter without my one of my grandmas who I love so dearly. Um, any poetry performance I had, any theater, any school award ceremony, my two grandmas were like front row every single time. So, you know, it meant a lot to me to kind of come this far. Um, and for a lot of it, you know, my grandma passed last May, a couple weeks before I was named National Youth Poet Laureate. Um, and she passed before I knew I was going to Harvard. So she didn't, she didn't get to see all these things. But, um, you know, the first Easter for me it was a lot because she was very religious. She would always make us memorize the books of the Bible. And I guess like my first interaction with poetry and spoken word and the spoken tradition was like at her house when she'd line me and my cousins up and make us go down the line and say Invictus or say the books of the Bible or perform something for her. Um, and so at Easter, they lined all the kids up and they sang their songs and they did their poems. Um, and it was just a really poetic experience for me to see kind of connect all these dots about where, you know, the oral tradition came from, where my relationship with song came from, and realize that, like, my praying grandmother was the one who, who like, put me onto all this and told me the importance of these cultural foundations, you know? And so it was, it was crazy being back in church, just kind of by myself, college student, um, and also just thinking so deeply about everything my family, our traditions has, has meant to me. So this poem is called The First Poem Was a Prayer, um, and again, I'll say it two times. It's a circular poem, and it's meant to highlight the power of the spoken word and the spoken tradition and the things we have to memorize and then repeat over and over. From the pulpit, the poem, the painful poem, the powerful poem, the people remember, the congregation snaps or sings, or cries, they come, and the poem is drinking history's wine, breaking bread to the body and its familial ties. The poem is the freedom, the fire and the brimstone. The poem is the praise, the sermon. The poem slams itself, stands the stage, throws down, ticks like time, erupts like a shout, stomps, makes it all right. The poem remembers, is remembering. My grandmother's hand holding my own, the poem is Invictus, and I'm lined up with my cousins, and we all look the same. The poem measures us. We say it pastoral. The poem is a hymnal, and we know it like the books of the Bible, both parable and pot on the stove, sung by the sweetest of choirs. We remember. Throw some grill. Say grace. Say it's good. We get country. We talk slow. Slam spades like squid of paper. Shout scriptures that sound like swear words. Stomp like a sermon. We remember. Trust in the Lord and the word. We work, we write, we remember, we write. Me and my family sitting out in the hot sunlight, passing plates, smoke rising, lawn chairs all out. We remember our rites, our rituals. We sew all right. It's summer, so my grandma calls me up in front of the congregation of all my elders and my juniors. Greasy black hands, smiles slick with barbecue and says, do a poem. <laughs> and my first poem is my last. And the first poem was a prayer from the pulpit, the poem, the painful poem, the powerful poem, the people remember, the congregation snaps or sings or cries, they come, and the poem is drinking history's wine, breaking bread to the body and its familial ties. The poem is the freedom, the fire and the brimstone, the poem is the praise, the sermon, the poem slams itself, stands the stage, throws down ticks like time, erupts like a shout, stomps, makes it all right, the poem remembers is remembering my grandmother's hand holding my own. The poem is Invictus, and I'm lined up with my cousins, and we all look the same. The poem measures us. We say it pastoral. The poem is a hymnal. We know it like the books of the Bible, both parable and pot on the stove, sung by the sweetest of choirs. We remember. Throw something on the grill. Say grace. Say it's good. We get country. We talk slow. Slam spades like squid of paper. Shout scriptures that sound like swear words. Stomp like a sermon. We remember. Trust in the Lord and the word. We work. 
we write, we remember, we write. Me and my family sitting out in the hot sunlight, passing plates, smoke rising, lawn chairs all out. We remember our rites, our rituals. We so all right. It's summer, so my grandma calls me up in front of the congregation of all my elders and my juniors, greasy hands, smile slick with barbecue, says, do a poem. And my first poem is my last. And the first poem was a prayer. Thank you all. It's been amazing to share some of these poems with you, some poems I love, some poems that mean a lot to me, um, and to talk a little bit about my experiences, about where I'm from, um, and also to share in the universal, in the stuff that we all know, um, and to celebrate this Juneteenth. I'm super excited to be here, and I'm super proud of all the work that's been done, all the work that continues to be done, and all the work that the next generations are going to do. So thank you so much. (laughs) 